we welcome you to worship this morning. Um, we are glad to be back in town. Just a couple of announcements real quick. Um, fellowship dinner is this week. You won't want to miss that. Um, there'll be good lasagna and all that kind of stuff um, this week. And don't forget, forget the connection card on the right. You can pull that off if you have some prayer requests or anything that you need to put down. Or if you're visiting with us, we would love to know more about you. Um, and just place that in the offering box in the back. Um, there were a group of six of us who were off in Guatemala this week. Um, so if you see us dragging a little, um, give us a little grace today. <laughs> so we got in about 10 last night, um, flew back into Orlando, but everything flight-wise, all of that was on time. We had a wonderful trip. Um, we were actually able to build a house the first two and a half days. We were on a house build um, for a, fa a large family. They've got four or five kids, and the parents and the cousins all live right there. It's a whole crowd, um, but we were able to provide them a house that is nothing like they've ever seen. Um, if you saw the house they lived in made of tin um, next door, um, you would know how important this is for them. And um, we're able to provide them not only with the house, but a group of us, which is a lot of fun rather than just build all the time, get to go the second day and shop for this family. Um, and there are a lot of things that they just don't have. And so we were able to buy them things and, and make sure that they had food. Um, we provide them with each with a water filter, um, which is very important in that region. Um, and so it was just exciting to be with them for those several days. Some of us kind of just parked ourselves a few times of the day and played with the kids and you know there's lots of fun things to do we had a lot of people building on that site and um, it was just exciting to see at the end um, when the father came in to the house um, he just couldn't hold back the tears um, and it was just exciting to see their reaction and to know how important this is and that we made sure that they knew um, where this house came from and that God provided this for them um, we were also able to um, to visit another ministry that we are friends with and kind of talk with them about their needs. Um, one of the other things that we get to do, which is really exciting, is go into homes. We, we partner with several ministries, and they know some, the needs of the families that they serve. And so we were able to minister to four specific families, um, providing them each with a water filter and some food and just spending time. Um, some of them are, are not believers, and so we get to share the gospel message. Um, a couple of them were believers. One of the families we visited, um, they actually lived in the church that they went to they're the, the groundskeepers for the church and they live there and um, and it's interesting because oftentimes we feel like oh we just have to be so serious and this was just a, a neat visit with the lady we laughed and carried on and you know and showed pictures of families and her little son her youngest son was there with a broken leg and we had a couple of our little kids with us and um, they were able to visit their friend and so it was kind of a neat visit um, to get to hang out with them. But we were able to share with several people. And, and Jim and Marsha actually had a, a lady that they shared with, and we were able to see her in a market setting not long after that and able to help her by buying some of her things. So um, that was a neat way to minister to her. Um, one of the really crazy fun things, um, one of the schools that we actually built a couple of years ago has about 50 kids in an outlying um, area. These kids have never left their little area of San Antonio. They've never left town. Um, and so we were able to um, rent a little bus and bring them to the McDonald's in Antigua. And so we gave them a happy meal. They couldn't believe they've never been to a McDonald's. You know, they've never been anywhere like that. So to give them a happy meal, they had an ice cream sundae. Um, we had pinatas, which got a little, <laughs> they're used to it, but we were like, that looks a little dangerous there. Um, but no, they had pinatas, and then we each gave them a, a backpack full of fun things to take home. And, um, and I'll try to maybe next week show you a cute little video that they posted on Facebook of, um, of the kids waving on the bus and yelling thank you when they were driving home so it's so cute it was neat to just to, to touch them and they are um, a neat little Christian school they sang us one of their songs while we were there and those kids get into every word every verse every motion I mean they're just really it, it's exciting so um, we truly appreciate your prayers and we know that you're here praying um, when we're off on these trips and that's the the biggest thing that you can do to help us for sure um, and it was a wonderful time we appreciate all the support for sure so thanks so much
Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Uh, it's good to have uh, the mission team back this morning. Uh, I've, I'm very familiar with the 10 houses uh, in that part of the, the world. Uh, a lot of the places that we were at in El Salvador had very similar uh, houses, so very familiar with those. And um, We've seen them in, in other parts uh, as well. We've seen mud huts and, and all kinds of stuff, so I understand those. Uh, Nathan's girlfriend is actually in Rwanda right now on a mission trip, so they're doing a, a lot of stuff uh, over there as well. So uh, be praying for her and her team uh, from her church uh, as they're over there. So uh, since we all know where we're going this morning, we've been in Psalm 23. Hopefully you might have already turned there, uh, but we're going to read, uh, let's read that one more time uh, together as a congregation. Uh, we'll read the entire Psalm um, starting in verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord. We ask you to bless this reading of your word. Uh, Father, bless this time as we uh, dive in a little bit deeper uh, to the final verses of this chapter. And God, help us to understand uh, our testimony to you as our shepherd. God, we love you. We praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so as I was getting ready and, and preparing for this um, message, I, I came across a story, uh, and I'm going to try to tell this story without laughing. Um, so I know you're going to laugh with me. I won't feel so bad, but I will do my best to get through this uh, without laughing too hard. But there was a church up in Seattle, Washington, that was having a big kickoff party uh, at one Sunday morning. And they decided it would be a good idea to bring in a life-size, six-foot-tall Barney dinosaur for the children's program. Now, kids love Barney, right? They like to watch Barney on TV. They like the little Barney dolls. But what they don't really care for is a full, life-size, size, six-foot-tall Barney dinosaur. And this one kid just literally flipped out when he saw this dinosaur. And this church met in like a... Uh, uh, a, a storefront uh, facility or a warehouse, so they really had to kind of partition things at it off. It wasn't a, a church building built for a church as a church um, with solid walls. They had to partition things off. Sometimes maybe just had curtains uh, to have the auditorium. It's separate from little rooms. Um, but this little kid's dad was supposed to help with the, uh, the offering and communion that morning. Uh, Mom was teaching uh, Sunday school or something, so she wasn't able to, to help calm him down. Dad was able to go get him and say, look, uh, let's go, just go to this back room here, and you just hang tight here, relax, and I'll be back when I get done with what I have to do. Sadly, Dad did not realize that that was the dressing room for Barney. And during everything, Barney come in, opened the door, pulled the curtain back, whatever it was, and walked in. And this kid just starts screaming at the, the just the, the top of his lungs, screaming like bloody murder. He, he didn't know what to do because it's a small, tiny little room. He's got nowhere to go. And this big, purple, six-foot dinosaur is blocking the doorway. So what does Don Barney do? Barney decides, well, let me help this kid out and let him realize it's not really a, an, an animal or a dinosaur. So he takes the head off. The kid starts screaming even louder and more frantically, he's eating someone, he's eating someone. And everybody in the church heard, obviously because of the small partitions. We all have things that we're afraid of, right? They didn't invite Barney back. They were supposed to have Barney there for two weeks, and they ditched him that first day. But we all have things that we're afraid of. There's a lot of things out there to be afraid of. And we've been looking at Psalm 23, and as we've just read, the Lord is our shepherd. We lack for nothing, correct? The shepherd provides, we've, we've learned in the last few weeks, that the shepherd provides rest and restoration. 
And here in verse 4, we're going to start this morning. David turns our attention to the fact that the shepherd, our Lord, is near to us in our darkest and most trying times. David picks out the one thing that we're afraid of the most. The valley of the shadow of death. The Valley of the Shadow of Death is actually a real place. It, it's literally there, um, and it was a very familiar place to David. Now, this place is located south of the Jericho Road as you travel uh, from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. It's a narrow pass through this mountain range. Uh, it's about four and a half miles long, and at some points as you're walking through it, the, the peaks are a thousand feet high. And at the base, it's smaller than the width of this room. It's about 10 to 12 feet wide. So how trapped can you feel? If you're claustrophobic, how trapped can you feel walking through that, knowing the treacherous part of this valley? There, there's a famous uh, or a well-revered um, uh, shepherd in that area uh, named uh, Fernando de Afonso. He, he said that this is probably one of the most dangerous places in that region for shepherds to uh, lead their sheep through because of all the, uh, the dangers that can be there. It could be animals, could be just, um, I, I'm not really exactly sure, but conditions f- make it necessary for shepherds to lead their sheep through this valley. It, it's, it's, it, it's a must. They have to go there to get their sheep from one grazing area to the next. And so they have to take this four and a half mile trip through this valley. When you hear that, you can understand why David describes from a sheep's perspective uh, the valley of the shadow of death. Because David knew all that. He's been there. He's experienced it. He's led his sheep through that dark valley. Paul even acknowledged the fear of death by making sure that we understood that death was conquered by Jesus Christ on the cross through His love, right? If you're a Christian, when it comes time for you to die, we have nothing to fear. For, the one, for there's one who will protect us. He's going to walk beside us through that experience. And how do we know that? Because he's already gone through that experience. Just like David leading the sheep through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus has already been on the cross. He's already conquered death. He was put in a grave. and was only there for three days. And he rose again. That is our hope. Our hope and salvation is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the cross, from the grave. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God is our leader. He's our shepherd. If we allow Him, He will lead us to the right places, And even though sometimes those places aren't places that we want to go. But He's going to lead us through the right places that we need to go. However, we need to understand that David isn't literally talking about a literal death. He's simply using death as a metaphor of of what not to fear. Because it's usually the one thing that we fear the most, right? I'm not afraid to die. To be transparent with you, I'm, I'm concerned about how I die. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm claustrophobic myself. I don't want to be stuck in a car under uh, water or in, in sand or something like that. I, I, I'm cautious about that. But death itself, as a believer for me, I'm okay. God, take me now. I'm ready to go. But sometimes we have these valleys and nobody's immune to them. We have these hard times in life. Notice that it's not the valley of death, but it's the valley of the shadow of death. Again, David isn't talking about death itself. He's talking about the shadow. He's talking about the things around us that might confront us, the, 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 the issues and the, the concerns of what's going on in our lives and in the world around us. He's talking about the dark and the troubling and tough times that, that we go through. So it's very possible that David is referring to uh, possibly the many fights that he had as a young boy, as a shepherd. With the animals that he had to protect. The, the lion, the bear, and all those that he had killed as he was protecting his flocks. It also could be referring to the time that he was on the run when Saul was after him to try and kill him. 
We don't know what dark times David could be referring to. But for us, it may mean something that we're going through. It could be a friend that's going through hard times that we're very close to. And we're having a hard time watching them go through that. It could be a child, a spouse. It could be a parent or any friend or anybody that we know. It could even be you or me going through a tough time. You don't know where you're going to get out of this. And all you can do is look up and trust the shepherd. One thing as Christians, we can be sure that we do, and we're going to, we will. We, make sure I said that right. We do, and we will, or we're going to go through persecution. It may not be pretty prevalent as of yet in, in this country, but it's coming. I promise you it's coming. It's coming quicker than you want it to. And yes, it could lead to physical brutality. It could lead to death. You may be staring someone down in the face that wants to hurt you. You're in the shadow of death at that point. Our time in El Salvador for, for eight years, um, we got to know this pastor in a small village called, and I'm going to have to say it slowly because I can't pronounce it correctly. It's hard. It's La Angostura. It's a small village, a very poor village. Uh, and Pastor Manuel was a contractor. He built houses and buildings, uh, was, made a lot of money doing it uh, in, in San Salvador, the capital. And so, but God got a hold of his heart and said, look, I want you to go do this. I want you to be a pastor. I want you to go plant a church. And here's where I want you to go. So he closed his business down, packed up his family, moved from a nice house to a tin shack on a piece of property that he used his own money to buy because God had blessed him and said, go buy this property, build a church, and you pastor that church. The road out in front of this church was being reconstructed, um, and the, the guys working on that road as he was there on the property doing some things, he ha had encountered them numerous times. He knew they did not like him. They made it well known they did not like him. They didn't want him there. They didn't want him disrupting their small village, uh, bringing uh, his gospel to that village. And one day, as Pastor Manuel was leaving to go and do some things, uh, he got confronted by several of these men. They stopped him, and they surrounded him. One of them got literally in his face with a machete and put it to his throat and told him, if you do not stop, what you're doing on this property, we will kill you. He was in the valley of the shadow of death at that point. But Pastor Manuel stood there. He's a very short guy, uh, maybe five foot, very small guy. And these guys were probably my size. Um, and he looked at them and said, if your God is greater than my God, then do what you feel you need to do. He stood there in the shadow of death, not fearing one bit, and just backed them down. One by one, they, they stood there in, in this little circle for a minute, staring each other down, and one by one, they walked away to the last one, the one that was holding the machete. Dropped the machete down by his side and turned and walked off. He was in the valley of the shadow of death. It's a perfect example of being in that shadow. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about in the book, his book, Cost of Discipleship. We're going to endure hard times. We're going to come across persecution. We're going to come across people that don't want to hear what we have to say. But take courage. It's not a mountaintop experience. You're in the valley. We can see the mountains all around us, and we desire to get up on top of those mountains, to, to be able to see further out. We want to know what Christ is doing. We want to know what God has planned for us, right? But all we can see is the valley right in front of us. And it's dark, it's grim. Try as we might, we can't get to the mountaintop on our own. But if we fully trust in God, to be our shepherd. And this is the caveat. This is the thing that's important for us to understand because everything rests on this thought. We must trust Jesus as our shepherd. Nothing else and no one else. 
When Jesus is the one who leads us, remember from verse 1, we have all of our needs met. We have all that we want. We'll be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. He is all that I want. And if Jesus is truly our leader, then we have nothing to fear. Pastor Manuel had nothing to fear because Jesus was his shepherd. He truly trusted that God would do whatever was needed. Pastor Manuel, he fully understood that he could die that very day. But he fully trusted that whatever happened, live or die, God would get the glory. His shepherd would carry him through. We have nothing to fear. Dark times no longer scare us. We certainly uh, don't want to die. I, I, I'm okay with dying, but I don't, I don't want to leave my family early. I don't wanna, and nobody wants to leave their family early. But fear is gone. And confidence is replacing it. No evil can touch us because we're being protected by the Lord, by our shepherd. How? Look at verse 4. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, Jesus has, or God has, the shepherd has this rod and, and the staff, and we have this uh, comforting like vision of the shepherd holding the staff. And usually the pictures we see, he has this, um, uh, this sheep laying across his shoulders while he's holding the staff, right? That's a very familiar picture for us. The staff is used to guide and to restore. Where have we heard that? Verses 2 and 3. When sheep fall into deep holes or crevices or they get into places that they get stuck and they need help, the shepherd can use his staff with the hook to just reach down and, and pick them up and pull them back and restore them to the flock, to safety. You ever wonder what the rod might look like? It's a weapon of defense. I'm not going to beat anybody up, but I actually have one this morning. I got this in Tanzania a few years ago. Now, Tanzania is a little bit different from a little bit further away from uh, Israel, but the Maasai warriors in Tanzania and East Africa carry these. They also carry staffs, and they use them to guide their flock. Whatever uh, goats, sheep, cows, whatever they're uh, herding, they use the staff to guide their, their flocks or their herds. But they also carry these clubs in their belts, and they're just kind of stuck there. It's a very dense wood, very hard wood. You're not going to break it, but it has the handle, and it comes to this knuckle, but it has this point on it. And it's highly believed that this is very similar, if not the exact image of what David would have carried as a rod, because it's a weapon that can be used to crush skulls. So think of the fight that David was in with a lion and the bears and, and the other animals that he had to kill to protect his flocks. He would have used a club like this to crush their skull. It's a weapon. Our God is a shepherd. He is a gentle shepherd. But our shepherd is also a mighty warrior. He's there to protect us, to carry us through, to make sure that we stay safe. We must also understand that He knows where we're going. He knows the paths to take. He knows the direction. We need GPS to get us across town sometimes. But the shepherd knows the right path to take. It's a familiar path, and we have nothing to fear. Why? Because the shepherd is standing beside us. He's not behind us. He's beside us. Where does verse 4 say says, for you are with me. It's a great statement from David. But let's be honest, we forget that part a lot of times. When we're going through tough times, we forget uh, and we feel betrayed and we feel alone. We, feel that, forget that, we forget that God is there with us, shepherding us and leading us through that dark time. We get the woe is me. How am I ever going to get through this? I'm just as guilty. I've done it. We all do it. We have to remember that the shepherd is with us. And that's why we need passages like Psalm 23 to remind us that God is always with us. The shepherd is walking beside us all the time. We realize that God is now walking. He, sometimes He's even crawling beside us when we're on our hands and knees. Maybe you're in, on your hands, <clears throat> hands and knees uh, crying out to God, God, would you please get me through this? Maybe you're next to your bed and you're praying, God, how am I going to get through this situation? Can I tell you, he's right there on his hands and he's with you. 
Scripture tells us He's beside us. The shepherd is always with us. He's there with you in your prayers and in your times, in the hard times. He's staying with us. We're all familiar with the footprints poem where they have the picture of of you're walking along the beach and all of a sudden you're not there, but the footprints are. What happened? It's because God carried you. The shepherd carries us when we can't walk any further. You see, God is with us in a stronger way when we're in trouble. Think of the 99, leaving the 99 to go get the one. The 99 are secure. They're good. They're not weak. They're, 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 everything's good. So he's leaving them to go after the one that needs the help. The weak one. The one that needs to be brought back into, the, into restoration with the flock. He's with us in a stronger way when we're going through those tough times. This can give us a sense of being invulnerable. Uh, because in a time when we're most vulnerable, during our valleys, we're vulnerable. But when we're vulnerable to God, we're invulner- we become invulnerable invul- because the only one that we're listening to is God. When we trust God, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Joshua 1.9 says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid or dismayed. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you may go. It's a beautiful statement of confidence from God to Joshua. Moses had died, and Joshua was about to lead these rebellious people into the promised land. He's now their leader. And I can imagine that Joshua was a little anxious. He's nervous. He has all leadership responsibilities now and God spoke these words to Joshua before they crossed the Jordan River the point that God was making to Joshua is that we should be strong and filled with courage why because we don't need to needlessly be afraid nor discouraged and disheartened all for the same reason the Lord God is with us he's going to go across that Jordan River with us. I, I saw a quote this morning on Instagram, and I screenshot it real quick. It says, just remember that God didn't remove the Red Sea. He parted it. He isn't going to remove the situation, but He'll make the way through it. Trust that God is always on time, even when you think He's too late. He's right there with you. It's a great statement. It's a great reminder that he, just like Joshua and the Israelites going through the Jordan, He's going to be right there with us. When the the Egyptians' army was chasing after them, he didn't just make the army go away. He opened the pathway for them to get through the Red Sea. He stood right in the middle of it for them. Stopped it and allowed them to get through. And then took out the army with it. His promises. He promises to be with us. It's a promise that we can always count on. Because all of these promises, we find that God prepares a table Uh, before us in the presence of our enemies we all have people that may not necessarily like us I try to be a good person I try to be a nice nice guy but I, I know I have people that don't really care for me we all have those people it's okay we may be persecuted maybe by friends maybe by enemies but despite being pushed and pulled by other people we come to see that God is with us and, and has, uh, He's even prepared a table uh, filled with the choicest foods and drinks. Look at verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You see, God often uses material things to speak to us about spiritual things. And here, God uses three things to catch our attention. He uses a table, oil, and a cup. He uses them to communicate how He sustains us. The table reminds us that God sustains us by giving us new strength. Even this, a table is made out of wood, but even this podium is made out of wood. It's pretty sturdy. You're not going to really wobble it too much. Um, It's not loose. It's well built and put together. God is going to give us the strength to stand with Him right there beside us. The oil was used in the Old Testament to commission prophets, priests, and kings. They were anointed with oil because God had a particular assignment for them to go and do. So the oil reminds us that God is giving us a new purpose. 
this new covenant in the New Testament. And the cup reminds us that God sustains us by giving us new joy. Our cup overflows. The gospel within us, Christ died on the cross, rose, uh, died, uh, put in the grave, and rose again on the third day. Our cup should be overflowing with joy so that others can see what he's done for us. The table is prepared specifically in the presence of David's enemies. Why? It goes back to verse 1. The, psalm, the psalm's central theme points to the word my. The fact that David lacks nothing is reinforced through every line throughout the entire psalm. The word my underscores the intimacy of David's up close, and rela- uh, up close relationship with the shepherd. And acknowledges that God is always with him. Looking out for his good even in the darkest valley of the shadow of death. Even in the most challenging circumstances, in the presence of my enemies, David lacks nothing because God is with him. Supplying every need and looking out for his welfare. So as you prepare a table before me, means that God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us for His own glory and goodness, as seen in 2 Peter 1.3. And as verse 6 brings us to conclusion, we can be thankful for our, de- our final destiny. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Think of the shepherd walking in front of his sheep. The sheep follow him, and they're following behind him. Uh, They're listening to his voice. But behind the sheep are these sheepdogs named Mercy and Goodness, chasing the stragglers to keep them close to the shepherd. The shepherd keeps you close to himself through his goodness and mercy always chasing after you. Every good thing in our lives comes from the hand of God. So we need to thank him for it every day, every morning. Sometimes hourly. It's that song, uh, I, I need you every hour. I can't think of it right now, but you know what I'm talking about, hopefully. Every hour I need thee. We need to thank him constantly for what he's done for us. Even the hard times, because the hard times bring us through to be stronger when we need it. They're not bad for us. They're just strengthening us. Strengthening us. When David looks beyond the days of his life uh, in this world, he he sees what comes after. And he's seeing the joy of eternity in the the immediate presence of the Lord. Just like your former piano player. She had struggles in this life. As she got older, she probably had more. It got harder to get around. But now, she's jumping for joy, running through the, the streets, uh, just she's in the hands of the Father, just enjoying life like she's never enjoyed it before. That's the image of the shepherd. Carrying us through that shadow. Getting us to the other side. Dwelling with the Lord will be incomparably better than the greatest joys that we've ever known on this life. I promise you that. You feel blessed by God, and you can even exclaim that now, even on this life, your cup overflows. Maybe God has has truly blessed you in multiple ways. You feel so blessed that there's joy and mercy and gladness, and it'll follow you all the days of your life. And that's why this psalm is, is the entire psalm, is our testimony of the shepherd, to the shepherd. It's not a funeral psalm. I know this psalm gets uh, spoken at funerals all the time. But this psalm is not a somber psalm. It's a joyous psalm. It's a psalm that we can get uh, excited about as we use it and and maybe even think of it as your evangelism tool or model for your evangelism tool and how you express what God has done for you in your life and what uh, good things He has given you, what great things He has shown you about who you are in Him. And if you're a believer this morning, who you are in Him is a child of God. With that alone, we should be able to say that our cup overflows because we can give Him glory for the great things He has done. We're so confident in the promises of our Savior that we can rest in His arms 
and love and grace. And so we come to the end of our time looking at this psalm, Psalm 23, with great reminder and promises that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If I were to die here this morning as I leave, pull out of the parking lot, get hit, whatever, I'm okay. I'm confident where I'm going. I know that He's with me in that moment just as He's been with me in moments prior. But I also know that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus told the disciples He was going to go and prepare a place for us. Uh, each one of us would have a place in heaven. And he's going to build a mansion with many rooms. And um, we're all going to have a registered place with our name on it. And that we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And all because, why? We followed the shepherd. My hope for each of us here is that we have followed the shepherd. And that we learn from Psalm 23 how God loves us and comforts us and empowers us. But the requirement, the conditions uh, must be that we allow God to be our leader, to be our shepherd and follow Him wherever He leads us. We may not like it, but know that He's leading us for His purpose. Remember, it's for His glory, right? It's for His name's sake. It's for His reputation, not ours. The Apostle Paul tells us that in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he, God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Have you done that? Have you done that in your life? Can you think of a time when you've given your heart and your life to Christ? Today happens to be my birthday. I'm 54 years old. It also happens to be my spiritual birthday. July 21st, 1984. I was at a youth event. I don't know why I'm crying. But I was at a youth event with a friend of mine, Dwayne Pope. And we were at his church. Um, I, at this time, I can't even tell you what the pastor was, was speaking about. But uh, God, I just felt God tugging on me, telling me, you, you've, you know, I grew up in church. My dad drove the, the bus for Sunday school. My mom was the pastor's secretary. I, I, I was in church before I was even physically born. But at 14 years old is when I realized that I needed a Savior. That I needed to follow the shepherd. And that day, I gave my heart and life to Jesus. I haven't always followed. We stray. I was one of those, those one that strayed sometimes. But I'm thankful that God came after me. And He didn't leave me out there to stay astray. He brought me back for restoration to the flock. It's been a back and forth in life, but I'm thankful that God never leaves us behind if you've done that praise him for that this morning if you haven't done it i encourage you i implore you this morning don't leave this building without giving your heart and life to jesus follow the shepherd he won't lead you wrong he won't lead you astray he will give you so much to live for ready to say that your cup overflows all because of who he is Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord. We thank you for today. God, would you stir in our hearts who you are as a shepherd, as a God, as a king. And Lord, help us to remember the love that you have for us, the love that you showed and, ex and displayed, and expressed on that cross. God, knowing that even when we do step aside or we take a wrong path, you're right there with us. You're chasing after us. It's a pursuit that, yes, we're to pursue You, but God, You pursue us just as much. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know You, God, would You stir in their heart, tug on their heart, and let them know the love that You have for them. Whatever you're going through this morning, if, if there's hard times, put your trust in the Savior. Even if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, even if He is your shepherd, maybe you're, you're questioning, God, why am I going through this? What have I done to deserve this? You haven't done anything. There's something He wants to teach you. There's something He wants to make you stronger in. Trust that process. Lean in on the shepherd and draw closer to Him. As we go into invitation, if you would like to make a decision this morning, I'm here, would love to talk with you. Uh, if there's deacons here that would love to talk you with you as well, if need be, if you would prefer to talk with them, 
whatever it is, don't let Satan hold you back in the pew this morning. Come to me afterwards. I'd love to even talk with you then. You don't have to do it during the church service. But as we stand and sing, allow God to tug on your heart. Open your heart and let Him enter in. Let Him draw you closer to Him as He wants.